Okay, th thank you, Sean. Uh, so I assume you can you can hear me and also you can see the uh, screen. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Sean, for, for for the very nice uh, introduction. And it, it's a great pleasure to be here today to present our recent works uh, for from in silico medicine. Uh, Insilico is a, is an AI-powered uh, uh, drug discovery uh, company, uh, and we are, we are focusing on four disease areas, uh, uh, including immunology, oncology, fibrosis, and also some CNS diseases. So today I'm going to give uh, a couple of uh, examples uh, uh, for, for the AI accelerated uh, drug discovery in uh, IPF and also HCC. Uh, so as we all know, the uh, pharmaceutical industry is uh, uh, be becoming one of the least uh, productive uh, industries uh, in the world. Uh, so from the uh, one paper from Nature Reviews in drug discovery in, in 2010, they reported that it takes uh, uh, on average more than 10 years uh, for from the discovery to launch a new drug. And the average cost is uh, uh, greater than 2 billion US dollars. And also, in addition to that, the uh, success rate is, is uh, uh, very low. So the overall success rate uh, from target ID all the way to the uh, 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 launch is uh, less than 5%. So the, currently, the uh, pharmaceutical industries are facing three major challenges. So the first one is uh, related to biology. Uh, that is how to identify a target. Uh, with uh, uh, with novelty at the same time with uh, uh, higher confidence, so it's a it's a, a target ID and validation. Uh, once you identify the uh, the proper target, the next uh, uh, challenge uh, the pharmaceutical industry is facing is a uh, related to chemistry. Uh, that means how to generate uh, uh, or how to discover a compound, a good compound with a uh, uh, great drug likeness uh, as a preclinical candidate to push for the clinical trials. And then the, the third challenge is the uh, clinical, is related to clinical trial. So how we can design a better clinical trial to, uh, uh, to enable uh, uh, the, uh, the best chance of success uh, in the cl clinical trial studies. So, uh, for these three uh, major challenges facing from the industry, in silico medicine has developed uh, three uh, AI platforms. We call it Pandaomics, Chemistry 42, and in clinical to address those uh, uh, those three challenges. For the Pandaomics, we use uh, uh, Omics database uh, to help to identify targets, and also we use test database to uh, help to valid, uh, validate those targets. And for Chemistry 42, we use a generative uh, uh, adversarial uh, neural network to help to generate the, uh, uh, the novel molecules and drug-like uh, drug -like molecules uh, to, uh, for, for the clinical trials. And we also have the uh, uh, AI platform called InClinical that can predict the tra uh, transition from the clinical trial phase two to phase three, the success rate uh, of, of that transition. Uh, so uh, all the uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, tools, they need a huge database. So for us, we have a, uh, we have a very big database uh, in, in our platform. So we have uh, uh, 10 million uh, omics data samples that including uh, uh, transcriptomics, genomics, uh, you know, proteomics, and, uh, and many others. We also have... Uh, 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 342 k uh, 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 clinical trial uh, trials uh, inf information. Uh, in addition to that, we have 1.3 million uh, uh, the informations about the compound, uh, uh, small molecules, and the biologics, uh, including their structure information, their uh, in vitro and in vivo uh, efficacy information, and also uh, uh, their their uh, 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 toxicology uh, informations. Uh, and we also have uh, more than uh, 40 million uh, publications that, uh, uh, you know, ha, ha, uh, in, in our database. So we have a very strong database and we have a, a, a very uh, powerful AI tool. Uh, with those uh, AI uh, platform, the question we want to ask us is, can we 
uh, uh, you know, combine the uh, biology and the chemistry using our uh, artificial intelligence tool to find novel targets and also novel molecules for some diseases uh, currently without cure. So that, that uh, we want to use uh, uh, idiopathic uh, pulmonary fibrosis and also the HCC as two examples to demonstrate how we can use our AI platform to, uh, to uh, accelerate the drug discovery. Uh, so for the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, it's, it, had, uh, it, was, uh, it is classified as a, a rare disease, uh, but currently it affects more than 700,000 uh, patients worldwide. So this, this uh, disease is a, is a very serious disease. So uh, uh, the mean survival time from di uh, diagnosis is, uh, is a, uh, a problem is uh, four years. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the disease is associated with a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, very uh, severe, you know, uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, that is the annual decline in lung function by 6.8%. Uh, 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 so uh, currently there's two drugs available in the market to treat IPF. One is called profinidone, the other one is called natadenib. Uh, so the combination of these, uh, the sales of these two drugs is uh, uh, greater than 3 billion US dollars uh, annually. Uh, and having said that, so both drugs have uh, pre, uh, pretty severe side effects. Uh, and those side effects lead to the dose reduction or treatment interruption. And uh, appro approximately 10 to 40% uh, of the patient discontinued, uh, discontinued from, uh, uh, from the drug because of the side effects. So that means there's still a huge medical need for this uh, disease. So uh, currently in the clinical trials, uh, the compound either approved or in the clinical trials for IPF, they are all focused on the known uh, uh, target. For us, we, we want to use our AI tool to identify novel targets for this uh, uh, huge uh, AMAT needs. So what we did is we, uh, we compare the uh, transcript, uh, transcriptomics data from the fi uh, fibrotic patients uh, uh, versus the uh, healthy uh, people. Uh, we can uh, find the uh, gene expression uh, differentiation, and we, uh, we we can use our AI tool to uh, to analyze those uh, uh, pathways differentiation, and uh, and then we identified uh, uh, more than twenty uh, novel targets for IPF, for fibrosis. And uh, uh, later on, we, we did some validation and also we apply some internal criteria to filter those 20, uh, 20 targets. The, the uh, filter criteria including the uh, safety of the targets, the drugability of the target, and also the availability of the crystal structure of the proteins. Uh, uh, and then we nail down to one target. Uh, uh, we, we call it target X for the, uh, for the next step of uh, research. And the next step will be uh, to generate the small molecules for this target uh, to push uh, to the clinical trials. And before uh, uh, we, we, I discussed about the uh, compound generation, I want to show you the, uh, how we identify, we can identify the target based on the, uh, uh, the, uh, for, the for the disease of interest. Uh, so this is the, uh, uh, interface of our uh, Pandomics AI uh, platform. Uh, so uh, uh, here I want to use uh, uh, the Crohn's disease as an example uh, to demonstrate how we can, we can use the AI tool to identify targets for the Crohn, Crohn's disease. Uh, so firstly, you need to type in the disease of interest you want to search for the target. Uh, here it shows some uh, uh, general information. Uh, once you click into that database, uh, there's a lot of data sets that right, you can see uh, for, for Crohn's disease. You can select uh, one data set, for example, uh, and also you can select the healthy uh, column uh, you know, as a control. Then you ask the, uh, the computer to run to help you to, to, uh, to uh, do the comparison. Uh, here you can see the result. Uh, they have the uh, different, uh, different uh, uh, express genes, 
and uh, it also uh, show you uh, what uh, kind of uh, uh, pathways those genes affected. So here in this uh, data analysis, you can see the uh, genes affected more than uh, 1,800 pathways. And uh, also here you can see uh, all the pathways has been uh, affected by the differentiated genes. Uh, some, some genes are uh, upregulated or some genes are downregulated. And if you, you are interested in one of the, uh, uh, the, the genes, for example, CDC6, you can click in and they give you uh, more information on this, uh, uh, on this pathway. And there's also a lot of uh, literature. Uh, so once you have done that, you can uh, select all the uh, samples you want to do the comparison and you click, uh, you click run. So here is a result for the Crohn's disease. So it gave you the top 100 targets for the Crohn's disease. You can see that uh, on the uh, left column, that's the genes of uh, uh, that's the target name. On the, on the right-hand side, there's a lot of other information. For example, if there's a small molecule column, means if there's any small molecules target this, uh, this uh, gene, the biologics and also the safety uh, shows uh, uh, how, how safe the target is. Uh, also, there's novelty. Uh, uh, that, that means how novel the target is. Here you can see that all the targets are not novel. That's because uh, during a search, we put a lot of uh, test data and, uh, and other data in. Uh, if you want to get the new, uh, the novel target, just click, uh, remove the test-based data, then you do the search again. Here you can see that the, uh, this is all the, uh, the uh, novel targets for Crohn's disease. Uh, you can see that novelty, they are either uh, yellow or green, uh, which means they are uh, very novel or relatively novel. So uh, this is a, a very uh, simple demonstration of how we can uh, use the AI tool to identify targets from, uh, uh, for, for disease of interest. Then I will come back to the, uh, to the real case. So for the target X for IPF, uh, because this is a novel target, there's no small molecules, for this target. The next step is to uh, use our uh, AI tool for uh, generative chemistry. Uh, we call it Chemist 42 uh, to generate compounds for this target. And uh, we generate uh, uh, hundreds of compounds. And from those, those compounds, we selected uh, less than 80 compounds to synthesize and test. Uh, on, on the right-hand side uh, uh, figure, on the bottom figure, you can see that's the measured uh, IC50 value of the uh, 80 compounds we have tested. You can see that the AI generated uh, compounds, uh, most of the compounds shows uh, uh, 10 to 100 nanomolar IC50 uh, uh, value. And there's uh, some compounds shows uh, much potent uh, uh, IC50, and there's some compounds shows uh, less potent activities. So in general, the AI generated molecules, uh, they are pretty good in terms of potency. And from those uh, close to 80 compounds, we found uh, one compound we called O55. That shows pretty good potency and also uh, a very good uh, drug ability. And then we move this compound to the next step uh, for further evaluation. So the next step is, uh, is to do the animal model. And so uh, here we use the bleomycin induced mouse model uh, uh, to evaluate the effect of the compounds uh, uh, in, in the fibrosis. Uh, you can see uh, on the uh, uh, left-hand side uh, figure, uh, uh, G1 is the sham vehicle, G2 is the, uh, is the model vehicle. Uh, and uh, once we give that uh, 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 mouse uh, with bleomycin, it induces the uh, lung fibrosis and it reduces the lung function. And the uh, G3, G4, G5, those three uh, 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 columns, uh, they are the animals uh, treated with our compound 055, uh, 6 mg per kg, 20 mg per kg, and 60 mg per kg uh, daily uh, for 20, uh, 21 days. You can see that all these three doses, they, bro uh, they brought uh, down the uh, lung function, you know, improve the lung function uh, dose uh, de dependently. And uh, uh, for the, for the uh, G6, that's the nitadinib, which is a standard of care for IPF, uh, 60 mg per kg. You can see that for the lung function improvement, our compound 055 shows a similar uh, efficacy 
at 60, uh, 6 mg per kg comparing to nitazanib with a 60 mg per kg. So on the right hand side is a, is a pathology. So it's a, we call the modified uh, Ashcroft score for this animal model. You can see again, the our compound shows those dependent improvement uh, for, 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 uh, for the pathology and it's comparable to the uh, uh, nitazanib. Uh, so then uh, that, that's the uh, in vivo animal model in mouse. And uh, uh, because this is a novel target, we want to get further uh, uh, validation uh, in, in human tissues. Uh, so here we, we did two uh, assays, uh, human uh, ex vivo, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in vitro data from, from the human uh, cells, IPF donors, uh, from the IPF donors. Uh, so here we did two uh, assays. One is uh, 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 called FMT, it's a fibroblast to a uh, myofibroblast transition. Uh, so that's uh, the fibroblast is from, uh, was from the IPF donor. And the second uh, assay is uh, we call the EMT, it's an epithelial uh, to uh, uh, mesenchymal transition. So th those uh, epithelial cells also uh, for, uh, 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 was taken from, from the IPF donor. You can see that for both assays, FMT and EMT, our compound O55 shows much better potency comparing to nitazanib. It's either five-fold more potent or 16-fold more potent in FMT or EMT assays. Uh, so this uh, demonstrates again that our compounds are more, much more potent than nitazanib. Uh, for from the IPF donors uh, uh, cell, uh, cellular assay, uh, that's consistent with the bleomycin induced mouse uh, model uh, result. And I also want to mention that FMT and EMT are hallmark events in the uh, pathobiology for, for IPF. Uh, this is very uh, important. Uh, and uh, uh, then we nominate uh, 055 as a preclinical uh, candidate. And before we, we did the nomination, we did a lot of uh, uh, wet experiment uh, to support the uh, the uh, further progression of this compound. We did enzymatic assay, uh, uh, cell-based assay, and also the uh, FMT, EMT assays, as, as I mentioned. Also, we did a lot of in vivo studies, including the uh, animal models uh, uh, and, uh, and also the DMPK, uh, ADMI studies, uh, toxicologies, and also safety tolerabilities. We did a lot of studies and we nominated these compounds as a preclinical candidate for, uh, for IPF. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a summary of this, uh, this case. So uh, for, for this uh, novel target, uh, from the target identification to PCC nomination, we spent uh, uh, 18 months and we spent uh, uh, 2.8 uh, million US dollars uh, uh, to, to achieve the PCC nomination. If you compare with the traditional approach, that typically need 4.5 years to nominate PCC for novel targets, and it, it will spend much more. So this means uh, the AI-powered drug uh, 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 artificial intelligence can really accelerate the drug discovery. And this target is not only for IPF. Uh, it, it's also, uh, uh, it can be also applied in the kidney fibrosis, skin fibrosis, and the liver fibrosis for Kidney fibrosis, we also have a PCC. For skin fibrosis, is currently we have uh, animal models ongoing. And for liver fibrosis, we have the cell-based data uh, and we, we are planning for the animal models. So uh, this is a uh, UUO model, uh, a UUO uh, mo uh, mice model for kidney fibrosis. This is another compound, O73. You can see that from this uh, pictures, the uh, the top left uh, picture is a sham control. Uh, the middle one is a uh, vehicle. The right hand side, top right hand side, is a uh, positive control uh, uh, compound, 100 milligram per kg daily. You can see the bottom uh, three figures. They are uh, the uh, the mouse uh, treated with our compounds. In the the left hand side is a low dose. Uh, middle one is a medium dose. The right hand side is a high dose. You can see that at the medium dose and high dose, our compound O73 can, can uh, 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 improve the, uh, the kidney fibrosis uh, significantly. Uh, and for this compound also, 
again, we did a lot of uh, uh, preclinical work to support this compound to move forward as a preclinical candidate for kidney fibrosis. Uh, that's the story for the uh, uh, fibrosis uh, project. And for this project, we use AI uh, uh, engine to discover a novel target, and we, uh, uh, we discover uh, 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 a novel molecule. And currently, this mo molecule is in uh, clinical trial phase two uh, in New Zealand. Uh, and we are pushing uh, that molecule as fast as we can to, to the uh, phase two trials. The second uh, example is uh, related to the alpha-4. Uh, so, uh, uh, so in 2021, uh, alpha-4, you know, created protein structures. They have uh, very uh, great, uh, you know, uh, accuracy. Uh, it is, in, you know, uh, the performance on the uh, CAS-14 uh, com competition, uh, you know, the, the alpha-4 uh, beat all the other competitors. And it shows uh, greater than 90% of the accuracy. And at the same, uh, uh, in the same year, uh, uh, the mind disclosed uh, the, uh, the human protein structures or the human protein structures are predated by alpha fold. So for us, we want to see if we can combine uh, the alpha fold predated crystal structure of the protein uh, uh, to uh, with our chemical fold to engine to uh, to uh, to generate small molecules for the uh, for the proteins that without any uh, uh, crystal structures, uh, and here the uh, the the, uh, the program the the disease of interest is a uh, HCC uh, uh, hepatic cellular carcinoma, uh, and uh, 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 we identify one target it's called CDK20. So this target is not only to modulate the uh, cell cycle uh, uh, and uh, oncogenic signal, uh, signaling, but it also can have the uh, uh, function of the uh, immunosuppression. So we think it's a, it's a good uh, uh, target. So again, for, for this uh, uh, target discovery, we use pandemics. Uh, you know, uh, we put HCC as a disease of interest and we use uh, pandemics uh, to identify the uh, novel target for this uh, disease. And from the uh, target identification, we identified quite a few of the uh, novel targets. That uh, CDP20 is one of them. Uh, was one of them. The reason we select CDP20 is because currently there's no uh, crystal structure for for this uh, for uh, uh, for this target, and we uh, we, we uh, uh, but there's a alpha fold predict structure. So the next step is to use chemical 42 to generate the, uh, the uh, molecules uh, for, uh, for, for, for this target. And uh, because there's no crystal structure for CTK20, we, we use the uh, alpha fold predict structure and we put that structure into the chemical 42. But before we, we, can put, uh, we can use that structure, we need to do some uh, uh, structural modifications uh, refinements from the alpha fold predicted structure because there's uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, you know the uh, motives that with the very low uh, confidence from, from the alpha fold. So we did some refinement and then we put the refined structure into our chemist 42. Uh, and here is the uh, how the chemist 42 work. And once we put that uh, uh, crystal stru uh, predict structure into our chemist 42, it will identify the binding pocket for the crystal, uh, for, for, for the protein. Uh, and also we identify the, uh, the key interactions. And uh, then the next step is to set up the uh, reward. We have the packet reward, we have the heat reward, pharmacophore reward. Uh, and also there's a, a preliminary fragments you, you can select. Yeah, and you can also set, up, uh, set the novelty score uh, if you want to uh, to have the very novel uh, compound, you can set the uh, novelty score high. Uh, and the next step is to set up the uh, the properties of the molecules. You can set up the C log P range, the molecular weight, hydrogen bond donor, hydrogen bond acceptor, uh, and so on. Uh, and then you can select the models. In this uh, uh, AI platform, we have more. Uh, we have uh, thirty uh, generative models to generate the compound. And then you click the run button. So the, uh, the machine will run for 72 hours.
to generate the uh, the structures. Uh, and uh, uh, here, I, I just uh, I don't have to turn to wait for 72 uh, uh, hours, right? So uh, you can see the results. You can see the result here. And this uh, slides show this picture shows you the how how good the, the, the performance is for each model. And here you can see uh, the actual the uh, molecule structures of the molecules generated by our chemical model. You can see that this is the one of the uh, compounds generated, uh, and uh, uh, you can see how it can bind to the protein, how fit, uh, how it can fit into the uh, into the pocket. So that's how we use chem our chemical forty two to generate compounds from the scratch, right? So as long as you can give it a, a, a protein structure, no matter it's a real crystal structure or it's a alpha fold predict structure. It, will, it can generate molecules based on the binding pocket. Uh, and uh, using this way, we generated close to 9,000 molecules. And then we used the virtual screening to prioritize those uh, molecules. We prioritized 50, uh, 54 molecules for synthesis. And uh, uh, for the first batch of the uh, compound, we synthesized, uh, synthesized seven compounds, and one of them was uh, a weak uh, uh, binding uh, binding potency. The KD value is the 7.3 micromolar. So we got a weak heat from seven compounds generated from from our chemical for the two. Then the next step is based on that molecule. We did another generation using the same uh, protocol. And uh, this time we synthesized six compounds. We improved the potency. Uh, one of the compounds has been improved to the KD value of 100 nanomol, uh, 180 nanomol. So currently we are doing the third generation and we have achieved uh, the, the single digit, uh, double digit nanomolar uh, potency. So this is a story for uh, using alpha fold predicted uh, 3D structure uh, to, uh, you know, to facilitate our compound generation using 2042 AI uh, platform. So uh, in recent years, we've published a lot of papers and uh, we use pandemics to do uh, target discovery and chemical 42 for, uh, for the uh, compound generation. And we have built a lot of coll collaborations with, uh, with the uh, uh, external partners uh, using our AI engine. Uh, and here, uh, I want to uh, mention our uh, founder and CEO, uh, Alex. And uh, he, he is a, a, a GPU veteran and also uh, very experienced in public discovery. And uh, he's, uh, he co-founded the la largest uh, aging research for drug discovery conference uh, worldwide in, in Copenhagen. That's, uh, that's uh, one of the biggest uh, conference for aging. Uh, and uh, uh, our company in silicon medicine is the AIDG. Uh, we uh, combine the AI and also drug discovery uh, very efficiently to uh, to accelerate the drug discovery, uh, and that's all what I want to say for today. And thank you very much for for your attention. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Paul. That's very informative, and uh, thanks a lot for sharing us with the promising results you generated. Uh, I think I can start with uh, a broad question. Uh, in your talk, you uh, showed us how the AI can help identify the uh, tactical genes for certain disease. And uh, uh, once we have these potential drug targets, you also show that uh, the, the AI generated compounds can contribute to the drug discovery. So I think there are uh, two parts that AI had involved. Uh, one is the uh, uh, gene di uh, target discovery, the other is drug discovery. So I I think I, I would like to ask, based on your experience, uh, what's, what is more challenging uh, for these two pipelines? And uh, do they share any uh, similarities? Yeah, yeah. so uh, in general, the target discovery is more, is more challenging uh, because it's, uh, it's really hard to validate. Uh, so if, if you identify one target, one novel target, it's, it takes you a long time to validate if the target is a, it, it, it's a valid target or it's a is a false one, right? So you need to uh, to generate the molecule and push the molecule all the way to the clinical trial to validate this target is if it is a if it is a good target for the disease. Uh, so uh, on the other hand, for uh, compound generation, it's uh, it's easier to validate.
because you know once you uh, generate the compound, you can synthesize that and test that, uh, you know, in an assay. So it's it's quite uh, uh, straightforward to validate the compound. Uh, so so that that's why I think the target uh, identification is more challenging than the uh, compound generation. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I'm really excited. Um, to share some of our experience uh, with the experts and colleagues uh, here at the conference. Um, I want to talk about uh, this work, which is uh, uh, still in the pre preliminary uh, research phase, but uh, keep us excited. Um, uh, I give it a, a nice um, tight, uh, just an overview uh, to begin my presentation. Uh, to show that uh, we are really interested in taking diverse omics data set from biological samples. Uh, we normally use uh, not just a machine learning and AI uh, straightforward approach, but instead we're trying to understand the relationship between different biological entities and the build uh, models that incorporate a lot of the prior biological knowledge. And then from these models, we try to do simulations and perturbations. And in the end, we want to uh, develop precision medicine solutions that can help directly in the clinical setting. So I want to start by saying that, uh, that um, in many diseases such as cancer, sometimes precision medicine is the road there is not as rosy. And for example, uh, this is a picture that is fairly well used to promote a, a why precision oncology is so important. If you have three cancer patients, cancer patient A and B have cancer in the same organ, but different mutation, of course you use uh, sequencing techniques and sequence the target mutation, target gene mutation, use different drug. If patient C has a different cancer, but supposedly shared similar mutation uh, profile uh, with a patient A, maybe you can reuse the drug. So that's, uh, the, the, I think, uh, the canonical definition precision of oncology. However, there's an editorial in Nature at uh, six years ago that says, if you look at the whole spectrum of cancers, not just the easy cancer that have a uh, well-defined mutation uh, profile. And uh, through the NCI match trial, the uh, outcome uh, of those trials with targeted uh, sequencing uh, can usually pair less than 5% of the patient. And in terms of the clinical outcome, uh, improving patient, patient uh, lives, and it's only a couple of months uh, of life extension. So it's not as dramatic as we had hoped. But I think a lot of people, including myself, realize that the primary reason is not the approach of precision medicine, but mostly it's about the naive approach. We're thinking, oh, the target gene is the primary driver of the, uh, uh, the therapeutic outcome. For example, in, uh, uh, in a paper that was published four years ago, and it really uh, uh, talked about the heterogeneity of cancer drug treatment to different cancer patients. So in the study, they sequenced uh, colorectal cancer from three patients. And then for each patient, they also uh, got uh, cells from different locations, and then they isolated a clone to do sequencing. Of course, they see very diverse sequencing mutation profile. If you actually put it in PCA plots, you see more or less from the same patients, uh, they're very close to each other, but depending on which part of the original cell come from, there's a lot of uh, divergence. Not only that, and the paper also showed that when you do uh, just uh, um, uh, get the single cell clone 
from each of the patients and apply it to different drugs, right? And then the color profile indicate different survival because of the, uh, the use of the drug. And uh, the red means uh, the, the better survival of the, the cells from the drug and then the, uh, the darker color indicate less. So you pretty much see that uh, there's a very high heterogeneity of the drug sensitivity, uh, not because of the same patient, they will have the same profile. So we know that the tumor would evolve over time and space. A simple naive view of clustering the sample may not actually work. And, and the more sophisticated view of a tumor or space of time is well defined by this article. And uh, let's say hypothetically, the tumor really evolved from a single small mutation. And uh, as you go ac uh, across the time and this uh, mutation induce a tumor to grow over space, which is X, uh, uh, just a uh, axis, and then uh, you will see that, that there's additional mutation like a large deletions, amplification, and uh, subclone would also compete and then uh, just uh, die out by itself. And then certain clone would become steady, certain clone will become shrunk, but certain clone would expand. And in this process, the human system is not sitting idle. An immune system will detect the tumor and started fighting certain clones and with different degree of success. So at any time when you try to sequence the tumor, you are actually just getting a snapshot of whatever is battlefield at the time. And of course the tumor would also metastasize and then establish new clone. When you apply therapy, uh, maybe some of the clones will shrink, but then not completely. And that's why it's a, the tumor is like a battlefield. And it's very difficult to treat a many uh, tumor because of the resistance or because of the different cloning expansion. And uh, it's very difficult to win the game of the cancer. And uh, to the point that, uh, so this is another uh, another view of uh, what I just showed earlier from another paper that uh, you start with a, a cancer uh, carcinogenesis and uh, you can detect the cancer if you detect it early and uh, maybe the tumor was relatively naive. If you try to pair up the drug at this point, and when the tumor already evolved and then different clone come out, even if you have the perfect therapy to say, oh, uh, this part must be reflective of the cancer and then you completely wipe out this clone, but the part that you didn't sample will eventually wane out. And in the end, the patient still die. So we need to come up with a better strategy to fight against cancer, right? So the target therapy works, but then the patient dies. So we need to come up with a better strategy. And I think uh, we have to, uh, in my group, uh, we're really interested in thinking about the fight against tumor as a game. So uh, the, uh, the cancer game theory is not new. If you look at the literature, essentially uh, there are different kinds of uh, competition. If you uh, compare the game as tumor cells and the host cells that are fighting the tumor, right? So there's a competition. For example, tumor is always competing with neighboring healthy cells for the resource, like a nutrient. Um, and then also there's a so-called parasitism and the tumor would actually uh, just uh, become addicted to the growth factor and then they would replicate. Um, and then there's a predictation uh, and the immune cells will chase after the tumor as soldiers fighting against uh, the enemy soldiers. And then there's also mutualism that somehow there's certain clones and cells, they are mutually agnostic to each other. So if you can actually 
the, the key of a game theory is that you, if you can actually accurately detect the state of the, the battlefield, and then maybe you can come up with a um, solution. So there are, of course, uh, two forces. One force is trying to win, and, uh, and then the other is trying to just, uh, uh, just uh, um, get wipe, uh, wipe out the enemy. So how do we actually um, define the uh, game board uh, becomes uh, particularly important. So luckily, I think in AI, uh, there's uh, actually a new concept called embedding. And uh, we believe that embedding is a key, holds a key to defining the uh, game board uh, with uh, some careful design. So you have multi-omics uh, profiles and these uh, profiles will become very high dimensional. And uh, so I think usually the game board is something that is uh, relatively conceptually concise to think about. So we say that, that maybe you can use uh, things like Tiffany or UMAP, uh, which is very popular in single cell analysis, but single cell are not samples, right? They're, they're just uh, sometimes they're replicate, they're very similar. But we want to actually define a board that shows all of the, uh, the prior knowledge that we know about the cancer, right? So maybe if you have sufficient number of samples, for example, from TCGA, you can chart out this game board. And so we, we say that the game board have positions and uh, maybe each of the position can uh, correspond to different clinical outcome. Like in this case, the green one would be relatively better outcome and the red ones are relatively bad outcome. So there are certainly, it's like a, a chessboard and there are hot spots for cancer deaths. And then there are hot spots for uh, just a cancer inhibition. So the question of defining this cancer game board is, what state are my current cancer patients are in? And can we actually drive the cancer patient from relatively bad spots to relatively good spots? If so, uh, if it can be proven uh, uh, to work, and then uh, I think that would open up new therapeutic strategies. So what about the heterogeneity that I mentioned earlier? So it can be mapped. For example, if you have some single cell data and that you can map the different, um, like a, just, just a marker genes and they use the marker genes to define. So whether the, the different cell populations or different um, cells are occupying different spots. Right. And then uh, maybe it doesn't occupy one spot, multiple spots are okay. But uh, if you apply some kind of a treatment and they shift it in spot, as long as the shifted spot eventually go into the green one, which is a good survival, so you know that you're making good process. So conceptually, this is what we're trying to do, but does it really work in the practice? Uh, we know that we normally have uh, data that looks like this, gene expression matrix, sample versus genes, right? Um, and then, uh, so usually we just uh, explore the genes using gene ontology pathway analysis samples, and we just say, well, what are the uh, overall uh, clinical characteristics, survival, not survival? Uh, but I think that we need to do a lot more in characterizing the samples because the, uh, the game board requires a lot more annotations on what each position would mean clinically. And having just a very poor clinical annotation is not gonna help. And I'll just use a one example of cancer that we've been using, uh, studying uh, with our collaborators. Um, uh, this is called a glioblastoma. In glioblastoma, uh, many people may have heard about, it's a very aggressive, but relatively rare uh, cancer type. And normally it's got uh, 17,000 people in the US 
uh, who got this uh, disease. Um, Senator John McCain died of this disease. And the median survival time is only 12 to 15 months. It's very difficult to treat uh, because it's not only because it's a cancer in the brain, and therefore uh, you have to limited option for surgery. Um, you can't cut up the entire uh, just a brain tissue and there's a lot of uh, consequences. But also because many of the drug do not pass through the blood brain barrier. So your limited options are some lim uh, small molecule drug and the radiation and surgery. And okay, so that's, and surgery and radiation sometimes do not treat the tumor if it's invasive into the brain structures. And so we need a lot of uh, new strategies in treating it. Uh, the past work is just by using the sample versus gene matrix using heat map. Right, so you have these genes, um, and then you have these uh, samples that can be grouped into unknown, uncharacterized uh, subtypes. Um, so in this work done 16 years ago, they defined these subtypes as perneural, mesenchymal, and proliferative. And depending on the gene signatures, you can define the survival to be relatively better survival, which is perneural, or mesenchymal, and proliferation that have a really aggressive survival. So no game board was involved in the traditional way, but only gene signatures. Now we're gonna change that and come back to the game board definition idea. So uh, we believe that the embedding techniques and uh, it's uh, especially TISNI and the UMAP are very useful. And each of the dot here would be a patient sample. And uh, if we can get the patient sample properly embedded, just like the cell can be embedded in a single cell analysis, maybe we can make progress, right? Um, I'll, I'll just uh, show one uh, outside, uh, uh, just a uh, uh, inspiration using, um, using this example. So they were trying to study the, uh, uh, the COPD patients uh, with different smoking history. And you can go to this a GSC, data set, it has nothing to do with cancer, but I just want to prove a point. Uh, exploration of uh, clinical attributes on the embedding is very important. If you actually use a smoking status, current smoker, former smoker, never smoker, and you will see that the annotation are all over the place. There's no such thing called the hotspot of the annotation, uh, just a uh, area, and therefore, the whole idea of uh, annotating the game board would not work. However, uh, this research pointed out that you can, instead of uh, just doing this smoking status, if you do male and female, all of a sudden you see some patterns. In the middle, that's a male, and uh, somewhere on the outside is a female. So that's exactly what they did. They use a single cell analysis like technique, but except that they apply it to label of the gender and cluster the samples of COPD patients into C1, C2, and C3, where C2 is mostly male and the C1 is mostly female. Having that, and then they redid the cluster analysis and uh, they were clearly sh uh, showing that in C1, which is a green area, you not only have relatively distinct gene expression signature, but also you can see that this clinical features are mostly is a female. Essentially, what they're finding is female specific gene expression signatures. Whereas in this cluster, they're finding type one of the male specific uh, signatures. And then here is the type two male specific signatures. So by properly using game board, they were able to solve the problem of finding signatures dependent on the gender very nicely. So we came up with this uh, 
we thought, okay, so uh, tools like this would be important. Why not just uh, come up with a software tool that make it uh, finding annotation spots on the game board easier. So we published a paper called the Statistical Enrichment Analysis of Samples or SEAS, S-E-A-S. You can go there and uh, look up for this, uh, uh, just a paper and the website. So the basic idea is that uh, you have clinical features, you have embedding, and then we will help you visualize your samples in the game board in which you will find uh, a sample of interest and its neighbor looking for enriched clinical information, right? Um, so uh, the how we find the enrichment is quite straightforward, right? So we use gene set enrichment analysis like analysis, and uh, we, we can deal with um, attributes in the neighborhood that are discrete in nature or continuous in nature. So continuous variable example would be uh, date from in uh, date of just a living survival from the initial diagnosis. Uh, discrete variable could be the status of a gene mutation status. Right? So, so the, the software allows the output of these clinical features and the significant enrichment in the neighborhood and the p-value associated. So these are the features that are enriched, determined by the software in this example. Um, now, I don't want to go through the details. You can go to the software. I want to come back and say how we apply this to try to actually fight um, the, 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 the glioblastoma uh, treatment uh, problem, difficult problem. So in glioblastoma, there's a TCGA samples. Of course, you can go to TCGA and download it. At UAB, we also have lots of patient-derived models. And uh, uh, UAB really is one of the institution that knows how to make orthotopic xenograph samples that directly inject the tumor into the mouse brain. Therefore, they are much better than patient-derived models when the tumor cell were injected in other parts of the, uh, the mouse. And they've shown that it's a much more clinical, uh, just a gene expression signature is much more similar to the actual patient tumor. Uh, and then this is also better than the 3D microtumors that in the cellular matrix or neurospheres. So we're actually using the uh, patient-derived uh, xenograph models. And uh, we have these uh, IDs and we have uh, used a gene expression signature to find their subtype. We also have uh, mutation status and clinical data associated with these PDX. Uh, so these PDX are also omically characterized with the transcriptome, genome, and kinome. And in some cases, they've also done drug sensitization experiment and radiation resistant experiment. So now we're coming back to this game board and we're saying all the black dots are actually TCGA samples. And then can we now put the samples of the PDX samples onto the game board, which are the red dots? And then what can we learn from it? So so this is actually a, a different view that, that we, uh, we got. So what we actually learned is that the PDX samples are uh, in different places of the game board as expected because their patient are all different, very heterogeneous and uh, they mimic uh, what's in the uh, diverse database such as TCGA. And so we take a specific line called the X15 16. And in this neighborhood, there are other PDX, and then there are some, the red dots are the TCGA. When we look at the most similar TCGA samples, we look at one simple characteristic, which is survival date from diagnostic, it's 242 days. We know that on average, patients survive at least one year. And this is even less than a year. So it's really short that indicate this is probably a perneural 
or very aggressive type of uh, uh, GBM subtype. Now, uh, we did actually see the radiation sensitization. There's a, this line, originally before the radiation parental line is, is in this spot. After radiation treatment, it stays in here. So we already know that this is a radiation and tamazolamide resistant strain. The fact that it stays in there really uh, confirmed our suspicion that maybe this method really would work. Now we switch to a different one, uh, which is in a similar neighborhood to begin with, but after radiation treatment, go to a different neighborhood, right? That's a treatment line. And when we look at the original ones, it is uh, 200, the short survival neighborhood, and the new neighborhood is actually a lot longer neighborhood. So that really give us another evidence uh, that uh, a method like this to deal with such a complex data, we have hope because we not only can use uh, the patient derived xenograph samples to characterize the patient, but then we can also use uh, simple AI embedding techniques uh, to characterize um, the before and after treatment. Now, we're not even happy with just the fact that these shift. What if it shifted because of random effect you observe? And so we further think about combining this with systems biology. And this is from another software embedding, but that we say, okay, we got mesochymal and this is a preneural. We know that these are the two completely opposite subtypes Preneural is very aggressive, and then uh, uh, no, preneural is very aggressive, mesochymal is uh, not. And so, so can we actually look at the clinical uh, enrichment and then also look for gene expression signatures? Right? So in fact, we use a gene terrain, which is a technique we've been using in this lab for more than 15 years. And uh, these are heat map, however, the heat map organized by the underlying gene-gene interaction network. Um, and then you can see that the two uh, signatures are quite different. So in fact, in cluster A, we got a gene terrain profile that looks like one spot is really dark blue, meaning suppression of expression. And cluster B, uh, is actually overexpression. So um, we have developed a software techniques and waiting to be published, but I just uh, showing you a preview that this essentially correspond to overwhelming high expression of these uh, network of gene signatures. And this is a down expression of network gene signatures. We can even look at the sample level expression and uh, to confirm that at the sample level, whatever is in that cluster, and they also have um, just a, a low and high contract. So, um, so what exactly is it uh, just a gene terrain? I, I don't think I have time for it, uh, but I just wanna show you that in the ISMB, we have papers that describe the underlying network layout, which is a completely just a just a different line of work, but but the, the devil is in details. The layout is very important, and we use a not the standard organic layout, but we use a network inspired topology hub centric layout uh, to to plot these uh, gene terrains. So if we can plot that, and then we can get the regions of the genes, and we can characterize uh, the underlying pathways, and then uh, confirm that whatever we found out that is uh, expression level differences is can be actually traced back to genes and network. And the, another thing that we, we have also done is we can also find gene signatures linked to patient survival. Um, so for example, this is another example. We look at the, uh, the gene terrain and uh, if we want we're interested in not just in genes, but we're interested in the uh, their survival panels. And uh, 
so so essentially we can get the underlying genes uh, and then build a survival panel, okay? And then this is the survival panel that we have built. The p-value is significant. And this panel is solely built from gene terrain, the fact that we were able to find differences. And in fact, we validated if you only plot the underlying genes, even though each of the genes are differentially expressed and the survival uh, curve, none of them are significant. And if we go to the other six of the 12 gene panel, none of them are significant. So coming back to this, uh, the whole idea of what we have done is we have first come up with a, uh, a cancer game board. We can actually use the tools to characterize the clinical features and find the clinical hotspot. And further on, we can take the samples, we can try to analyze what exactly is at the gene level or network level is uh, showing the differences uh, at the clinical level. And from that, we can even further find the survival gene signatures that may help uh, with the clinical utility. So uh, with that, and I think I'm running out of time and I'd like to say uh, that, um, yeah, so, so thanks, thanks to these people and maybe take one or two questions. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jack. It's very nice to see the uh, PDX models of GBM. Uh, I think uh, maybe I can ask you a quick question. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, can we use these uh, PDX models as well as the uh, system biology approaches of AI uh, algorithms for the uh, precision medicine? Because you uh, you model cancer as a game, so I'm, I'm wondering how can uh, these uh, uh, preclinical models and in silico uh, approaches help us win the game of cancer? Yeah, that's a very good uh, point. So I think uh, what we what I have shown is a very limited uh, success using PDX and you uh, try to run different drug treatment on PDX and then confirm where it's moving the PDX line on the spot of the game. So if you can actually systematically do all the drugs, maybe a thousand drugs on these 100 PDX, and all different uh, perturbations. So you already have like a recipe of like a go chess. And if you play go chess, you already know that what are the known solutions. So whenever you have a new uh, new cancer type coming in, even that's not PDX, you can match it to the PDX that you already have. You already know that these PDX will, will go into different fate depending on the drug and then you would just directly give patient the treatment and hopefully you can out gain. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here, even if virtually. Uh, and I'm happy to tell you about my work on the quest for deep knowledge, decoding the human genome with deep learning models. Perhaps the most fundamental question of biomedicine and biology is the mapping of phenotypes to genomes. True molecular understanding of human disease requires us to fully map specific coding and non-coding variants to their biochemical and phenotypic effects through the complex cell type specific molecular circuits. To map the connection between genome and phenotype, we thus need to predict specific functional impacts of variants through mapping of cellular circuits to precisely identify their phenotypic outcomes. In this talk, I hope to demonstrate to you that this task can only be accomplished through tight integration across human studies, tissue culture and model organism experiments, and sophisticated computational approaches that are able to interpret the genome in an unbiased and data-driven way, as well as map molecular circuits that these genomic changes are affecting in the variety of different cells and organs in our bodies. So before we go much further, I really want to emphasize to you that when we talk about genomes and variants, of course, there is not just the coding space of variants, but also the vast over 98% of the genome that is non-coding 
and of course affects the regulatory, uh, various regulatory roles in the human cells. And what we really need to do is to go beyond the approach of looking statistically at a specific non-coding variant present in a given subset of the population and trying to associate it with phenotypes just that way. That's a very powerful way, but it is not sufficient because many of those variants are highly, are very rare. Uh, we're not going to be able to find them in the same genomic context. They will have different outcomes, and often multiple non-coding variants are actually uh, going to be needed to detect a specific phenotypic effect. So what we really need is a similar sort of code that we see in the coding variant space where we have our genetic code that's familiar to us from every uh, textbook in genetics or molecular biology uh, that students learn in their first class. We kind of need a similar effect regulatory code where we're able to map every possible non-coding variant, be it common, rare, or perhaps even never seen before in sufficient numbers to be able to make any observations in human populations. We need to be able to map that variant to specific biochemical effects on binding of transcription factors, uh, epigenetic outcomes on histone marks, uh, as well as post-transcriptional effects. We find that actually deep learning can accurately predict impact of any variant at the transcriptional and post-transcriptional level. And of course, uh, our deep sea approach has come out in 2015, and there's been a huge uh, blossoming of this field. And there's a number of methods uh, of different types of deep learners, uh, both at the transcriptional and post-transcriptional level. Um, and at the post-transcriptional level, we're specifically interested in uh, a variety of different effects uh, mediated by RNA binding proteins, uh, be that splicing or RNA stability or transport. And that's our Sequeaver method that I will also discuss today. Critically, these models do not learn on any mutational data when they're training. So that means that they can predict the impact of any variant, even rare or never before seen variants, with single nucleotide resolution. Just to give you a little bit of an insight into how these models work, since they're published, I'm not going to go into huge detail on the deep learners themselves. Uh, is that we actually use at the base level the hierarchical structure to capture the context information of the se sequence. Uh, of course, the multilayer nonlinear transformation is allowing us to really capture the interaction of sequence features, which we know biologically is quite important. And finally, uh, at the output layer, we usually we really can leverage multitask prediction so that we can leverage cell types where there is less data. Uh, where there's more data to help us gain information about predictions for related cell types where there's a lot more data. And of course, that reflected, all reflected in this hierarchical structure where the convolution layer is really where we're scanning for motifs, then spatially scaling this in the pooling layer, and finally really capturing the higher order sequence features and interactions in the convolution layer. At the time, uh, what we uh, and others did not know whether this was possible to do, but it turns out that now we're in the field quite familiar with these models. And while they are not trained on any mutational data, once you have a trained model, such as, for example, DeepC uh, for transcriptional variant impact prediction, you can apply it to any variant. So in this case, I am just showing a, a hypothetical variant on chromosome 7, a change from A to C, uh, and the model can predict impact on thousands of specific features, so specific histone marks, uh, DNA accessibility, uh, as well as transcription factors. And then what might be one of those predictions is, for example, a significant effect on a transcription factor binding where, let's say, uh, your given transcription factor of interest can bind tightly to the A allele and no longer binds or bites very weakly to the C allele. And this perhaps could be used to explain the differences in phenotype that are associated with this particular variant. So these models are actually quite accurate. Uh, we've ex evaluated them extensively, both computationally, uh, as well as on external experimental data sets and on our uh, follow-up experiments. Uh, I will just show you uh, a number of papers that have used these models and everything from uh, AQTL prioritization to uh, in integrating them in uh, polygenic disease risk uh, uh, assessment to specific phenotypes like blood pressure, et cetera.
So when applying these models to full genome sequencing data, uh, here we're, I'm going to show you an example where we're going to apply it to, uh, in the context of autism, to over 7,000 whole genomes in the Simon Simplex collection. We're able, for the first time, to actually demonstrate significant burdens of non-coding regulatory de novo mutations. And this was actually true for any human disease, but here, of course, it's shown for autism. Uh, what we actually did is we identified this burden both at the transcriptional and post-transcriptional level, as you can see here, even though this burden was not detectable at the label, level of mutation count, as you can see in the red and gray bar uh, under the de novo mutations error. So the mutation count for the probands and siblings, unaffected siblings, was actually uh, nearly equal on average, whereas there was a significant difference in how uh, bad by these models were predicting these mutations of an effect these mutations to have. So essentially, the regulatory variants that ASD kids had were worse in their impact than those in the unaffected siblings, even though they did not have significantly more variants by count alone. This turns out to not be unique to, in, to autism. We now have another paper published in Nature Genetics uh, in collaboration with Bruce Gelb's lab from Mount Sinai and others looking at congenital heart disease, and we're actively working on these questions in other uh, diseases as well. We have actually experimentally shown that a um, number of variants that we uh, prioritize with high predicted impact do in fact drive expression differentially in luciferase reporter assay. These, of course, are very interesting candidates for future studies. And uh, what I find actually also very interesting is that there's approximately equal number of variants here that cause an increase in expression uh, of, the, uh, of the gene for the affected ASD individual versus a decrease. So this is a single letter change, a single nucleotide change uh, between the proband and the sibling uh, causes this change, significant change of expression in the suferase reporter assay. Uh, now, of course, this is not just at the transcriptional level. As I mentioned, we actually had a separate model, uh, Sequeaver, that was built specifically for looking at post-transcriptional effects. Uh, and we call these RRD regulatory effects. Uh, and I just wanted to show you one of those variants. And I'm showing this to you actually in a human-based uh, visualization where you can access all of our predictions and you can browse them and get them in detail, look at the specific predictions based on different features and cell types, etc. And so this particular one uh, is a prediction of uh, a regulatory variant that is affecting SMEC1. So SMEC1 is an important protein. It's a regulatory, it's the regulatory subunit of a serine 3 anion kinase. Uh, and it's actually uh, we could tell that it was not just a general RNA processing effect, but splicing because the top um, RNA uh, binding proteins uh, for this variant that our model was predicting to be affecting are all splicing factors. Uh, now, SMEC1 has never been associated with autism specifically in any way, but is an important protein that's highly conserved. And in fact, when we actually look uh, at this experimentally, Indeed, RD mutations can disrupt splicing. So we do find an ASD proband specific reduction in the long isoform of SMEC1. And this was actually done uh, in the lab of uh, our close collaborator, Bob Darnell, who is co-senior author uh, of this paper. Uh, and you can see that this is a significant reduction uh, in ASD probands. And in fact, when we look at the RD mutations in general, we actually find a significant association with phenotype in that low proband IQ is significantly associated with higher dysregulation at this RNA processing level uh, in the kids with ASD. So the kids with ASD who have lower IQ also have significantly higher dysregulation of their RNA metabolism uh, identified by our models. So then that really raised the question for us of, is this a general pattern? Is RNA binding protein target site dysregulation actually causal in psychiatric disorders in general? And of course, RNA binding proteins are incredibly important. They regulate all steps on the RNA life cycle. 
and in fact have been associated with a number of psychiatric disorders before, but from the perspective of mutations in the RNA binding proteins themselves, right? So what we are talking about is, is the target site dysregulation, so this picture on the right. And that's critical because while RNA binding protein themselves, their uh, mutations in them would be targeting that one particular gene or a couple of those genes. Over 90% of the genome, of course, are these non-coding uh, regions where a mutation in that area could actually prevent a perfectly functional RNA binding protein from binding. And could that actually be something that leads to psychiatric disorders? So that's what we are asking here. And just uh, I wanted to show you how we look at this. So what is the framework we are applying? Of course, we're going to use Sequiver, the same model that I've talked about before, for being able to predict the effect of any of the variants on binding of a number of RNA binding proteins. And this model, by the way, is trained on in vivo data uh, and allows us to look at a number of over 200 different RNA binding proteins and spans uh, effects beyond splicing, such as stability and transport. So we applied stratified linkage disequilibrium, LD score regression model, as the statistical framework for partitioning disease heritability into various functional annotations while directly modeling the extensive LD structure between SNPs. By combining this LD score regression with our deep learning framework, we can now directly estimate the contribution of RBP dysregulation to psychiatric disease. So we're going to use GWAS studies from the Psychiatric Disorders Consortium to be able to assess this. And I want you to be familiar with these graphs because that's what I'm going to show you. So we're going to look at these graphs where on the x-axis we're looking at the psychiatric disorder risk increasing uh, towards the right. And on the y-axis we're looking at RBP dysregulation, again increasing towards the top. So the lower line, if we see our data falling along that sort of uh, line, then that looks more like there's no evidence of association in that particular GWAS study. Whereas if we actually see that higher line where the higher psychiatric disorder risk is associated with higher level of RBP dysregulation from the stratified linkage disequilibrium framework, then that implies causal uh, association and causality to disease risk of uh, RNA binding protein dysregulation. And here's what we see. So here's the most well-powered uh, disease, and that's schizophrenia. And you can see that we, we find a very strong uh, evidence for association between uh, the RBP dysregulation and disease risk. And that's actually true across a number of diseases. So for ADHD, ASD, bipolar disorder, major depression, and schizophrenia, which are all the studies we've, that we've looked at that had sufficient data, we find that there is association. I would not look too much into the size of these right now because of course, there is also the power of the original GWAS that we we're studying. So I don't think we can conclude anything about the fact whether there is more of this effect in ASD versus schizophrenia or less of this effect in ASD versus schizophrenia based on that. But what we do see is in every one of these psychiatric disorders, uh, we see this association. And of course, many of these RBPs also have large number of coding mutations associated with neuropsychiatric phenotypes. For example, EF2, UD2, so that really implies that there is a convergence of effect both on the non-coding and the coding end that's really likely to cause psychiatric disorders. You can actually now use our website on human base, so hb.flatironinstitute.org, and you can look up all of these data. So you can put in uh, a protein you're interested in. So for example, in this case, uh, I'm putting in CACNA 2D3 and then see the results in this uh, heat map. You can actually mouse over and get a lot more detail. And actually this one particular, we did actually, so this is a transcriptional effect uh, outcome, not post-transcriptional, but you actually, we did test this particular one uh, with an in vivo expression reporter. And it turns out that particular variant that we predicted to have an effect indeed does control expression uh, and change it in a significant way. Now, of course, these variants aren't acting in by themselves, right? They're 
Uh, these proteins are part of the complex molecular circuits that are highly tissue and cell type specific. And it's really important to be able to understand how various uh, proteins, uh, once they're expressed, how they're interacting in these circuits. And so we're also very interested in mapping these cellular circuits with tissue specific functional maps. So the goal here is really to create maps of how various proteins interact in different cell types and tissues in the most data-driven way possible by using the large amount of functional genomic data, expression, physical interaction, et cetera, that gives us some view at how uh, this is happening in a functional protocyte in the kidney or in a particular neuron in the brain. So to do this, we now can take advantage of thousands of diverse genomic data sets that we have available in human and combine it with the tissue specific knowledge. The tissue specific knowledge could be coming from human or from mouse. So for example, uh, I will show you a little bit of a study uh, where we actually use mouse neuronal specific signatures that we map to human to identify which genes are expressed in very specific uh, types of neurons to be able to actually understand uh, neuronal cell-specific vulnerability uh, in neurodegenerative disease, in that case, Alzheimer's. And we can use these, uh, these connections as well as known pathways in human to be able to essentially use it as a hook in our Bayesian data integration. So we can use these uh, gold standard analysis for semi-supervised regularization uh, in Bayesian classifier uh, to be able to assess the evidence of how relevant and accurate each data set of those thousands of diverse genomic data sets is to the particular question we're studying. So let's say uh, to a particular neuronal subtype in the brain. And then we can integrate these huge numbers of data weighted by their relevance to that particular neuron to then assess the probability of tissue or cell type specific functional relationship between two genes and do that for every pair of genes in the genome so that we can get a functional genomic map that is a sex, essentially a summary, a probabilistic summary of all of the data available that is done in a way specific to that cell type or tissue of interest. So let me show you that these actually work first. Uh, so, um, they're accurate and they're actually able to effectively extract tissue or cell type specific signal, even from highly heterogeneous collections that might not even have any data that's coming from that specific sub cell type or uh, little data from that particular tissue. So in this case, uh, we're looking specifically at IL-1 beta, which is of course an important cytokine. Uh, and we were working with collaborators who were very interested specifically in uh, its role in uh, cardiovascular disease. So specifically, they're of course interested in the blood vessel cell type. And we are looking here at the top 20 interactors predicted by our integrated network, specifically the blood vessel network, uh, to be interacting with IL-1 beta. So this is again the interface that I'm showing it to you is directly human-based that I've uh, referenced before. And it turns out that we can, when our collaborators actually evaluated this uh, and basically looked at which genes changed their transcriptional levels, their uh, expression levels, upon activation and treatment with IL-1 beta, it turns out that the very first uh, time point, 18 out of 20 of those genes were significantly affected. And it turns out that actually the other two are just not transcriptionally regulated, but also correct. But even if we just look at 18 out of 20, that is a highly significant p-value. And what's also important is that accuracy of the blood vessel network for this is significantly higher than other cardiovascular networks and much, much higher than global network or those from unrelated tissues. So this was the most accurate network than any of the other cell type or tissue specific or global networks as well. We can actually use these networks as well to understand the network architecture of disease. So here I'm actually looking at uh, AD, GWAS catalog genes, and I'm looking at the hippocampus network. And you can see immediately that the clusters that we are identifying are actually clusters that correspond to key processes uh, known to be involved in Alzheimer's disease, such as uh, memory, learning, amyloid beta formation, uh, et cetera. Oops, sorry. 
So we can actually, in the human base interface, then zoom in to a specific one of these proteins uh, and be able to look at those genes. So this is five genes from the M1, from that amyloid beta formation module in the hippocampus network, and we're able to look at them in more detail, and you can uh, zoom in to particular interactions. So for example, uh, here we're looking at the interaction between MAPT and CA. MK2B, and you can see that the most uh, evidence used for this prediction is co-expression, but there's also data from GSAA uh, perturbation. So you can actually uh, go in and figure out exactly why the network made the prediction and what evidence was used, and actually go in all the way through to specific papers. So now that I showed you the how we make the networks in the interface, I wanted to go back to that study that I briefly mentioned. Uh, about untangling the basis of neuronal vulnerability in Alzheimer's disease using these networks. Uh, and this is in close collaboration with Paul Greengard's, uh, late Paul Greengard's lab at Rockefeller and uh, the really incredible experimentalist that we work with there, uh, Jean-Pierre Rosary. So cell type and tissue specificity is a key aspect of many complex human data sets. And in fact, it can be critical in understanding the molecular basis of such disorders. Alzheimer's is clearly one such case uh, where we need to peer into very specific neuronal subtypes that are specifically vulnerable to disease to identify vulnerability specific processes. We were able to use backtrap data from mice to measure actively transcribed RNA in specific neuronal cell types in mouse. And then we use it to provide cell type specificity to generate human networks for these cell types from very large compendia of non cell type specific human data. And I've showed you this on the computational uh, approach slide. So hopefully this actually is now making sense in the context of this specific disease. Then we can actually use machine learning of these vulnerable networks to prioritize AD associated genes and then to map them onto specific functional modules. So I've mentioned this to you and I've showed you how we do this again. Once we build this network, right, using the mouse data from neuron-specific signatures that we map to human, we can now use these networks to identify candid genes that are key to AD-associated vulnerability. What we do is we take the top hits from a quantitative genetic study, uh, so in this case, Alzheimer's disease, GWAS, and look at where the nominally significant genes versus the non-significant genes fall in the network essentially using the network neighborhood as features for a supervised machine learning problem. We developed this NetWAS 2.0 approach specifically for this problem in Alzheimer's, where it doesn't just do this, but it probabilistically subsamples non-significant negative genes to take advantage of the GWAS confidence scores, which makes this method even more powerful and robust than our original NetWAS approach. So here we use the original Alzheimer's disease GWAS and the specific uh, vulnerable neuron network to be able to prioritize all the genes in the genome by their associated in Alzheimer's disease, specifically based on this neuron specific vulnerability. We find that these prioritized genes are indeed enriched for Alzheimer's disease related signals. So here I'm showing you the enrichment in two sets of processes that are both considered hallmarks of the disease. And we see strong enrichment in both, significantly more so than the original GWAS study shown here. So placing these genes, prioritized genes on a schematic neuron, we actually identified the vulnerability specific functional module functioning in neurotransmitter release and located in the axon of these vulnerable neurons. This allowed us to make specific hypotheses about a mechanism that may contribute to this selective neuronal vulnerability in AD. And two key players that we identified are tau, one of the major players that we do not do know about in Alzheimer's disease, and interestingly, alpha synuclein, a gene that has been implicated in other uh, neurological diseases. And looking at what is connecting at both of these genes, we found PTB, a splicing regulator. And in fact, follow-up experimental results actually preliminarily show that it does indeed regulate tau and alpha synuclein in this neural type, and our collaborators are following up on this deeper in both model organs and in human cells. 
So I want to thank you all for listening to this talk, and I hope that I've given you a sense of how we can actually use these advanced deep learning models, as well as Bayesian approaches, to really develop predictive models that eventually, for now, can interpret the genome and decode the genome, as well as map biological processes. But in the future, we hope really can allow us to model complex molecular, cellular, and organismal systems at complementary levels of resolution, and really to be able to integrate molecular biology with whole organism physiology. And thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here. Hello, everyone. This is Jimin Sun from University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Today, I will talk about Scott, Cybermetrician, and Superforecaster, Deep Learning for Drug Discovery and Development. In many different application domain, talent selection is an important task. For example, in sports, you want to find the future superstar in sports and recruit them earlier. In finance, you want to find a company that will later on become super profitable, but invest them earlier. In pharmaceutical company, you want to find the drug candidates that later on can become approved blockbuster drugs so that you can invest on those drug development, drug discovery earlier. There are different approach for this talent selection problem. Traditionally, people are usually based on the Scott based approach where you have a whole bunch of experts in this domain, whether it's in the sports or in this pharmaceutical domain, their, their experience and intuition can help decide which superstar to invest. And then later on, data become important. So we have cybermetrician. So they rely heavily on data and analysis and statistics to make those decisions. Of course, everyone these days trying to make a prediction and trying to hope AI machine learning be the solution to lead to the super forecasters. So where did we achieve the super, super forecaster? I argue in games, a lot of traditionally very difficult games AI have achieved that. For example, in chess, in 1997, the blue already beat the reigning world champion, Garrick Kasparov. And that's just the beginning. And later on, uh, a couple of years ago, Arthur Go beat the, uh, the reigning champion in Go's, then Arthur Zero's has become um, capable of through self-playing and be able to master many different games. So if you look at the, the performance just in chess, here's the ranking of different chess programs, such as Stockfish, FedFrizz, and Komoto, and so on. And that's their Ratings, this ELO ratings, I mean, the higher, the stronger the programs. And this is the, the top ranked chess engine today. And just give you a kind of a reference point of human performance on this game. The world champion uh, Magnus Carlsen and his bliss rating in this type of games is 28.94. So it's almost close to a thousand points lower. So it's just a huge gap between human and machine these days on games. So what are the ingredients for achieving super forecaster in games? There are three different aspects. There's algorithms, high quality data, and the perfect environment for experiments. So for algorithms, there's different type of search and such as I mean, Traditionally, alpha, beta search, and then later on, Monte Carlo tree search. Then, recently, they developed a lot of 
uh, algorithm based on reinforcement learning and deep learning. So those are the algorithm development. They're very important. Then there's data, large volume of historical data, and then self-played games. So they help provide the training data. Not only they, there are a lot of games, there are also labels of those games, whether it's win, draw, or loss. Right? So the outcome is very clear, so you can provide a very clear signals for training the machines, the algorithm, right? how to get to the winning state. And there's a perfect environment for experiment. You can do this end-to-end -end test against other game programs that's through self-play, and they're realistic, they're very low cost, and they can do it in real time. That's how AlphaZero can play against themselves just in a few hours, hundreds of thousands of games. And you can also do this efficiently in real world, right? So you can play against human experts and they can play against a chess program or other game programs. So that's a perfect environment for experiments. Come back to drug discovery and development in the pharmaceutical industry, where we are. So in algorithm space, we, we, a lot of times depends on statistics. In discovery, we also rely on simulation. And in all these different phases, discovery, development, and commercial application, we rely on experts' intuition. And machine learning become important. Everybody thinks they should bring machine learning to their team. So that's a good uh, development. And high quality data. Well, we have a lot of siloed data at different phase of this discovery and development process, such as experimental data, scientific research, literature data, and clinical trial data. And in the commercial space, we have electronic health record, medical claims, and so on. But we just don't have um, connected data. So we need more data and more connected data. So the environment is the problem. Really, benchmarks are lacking, and experiments are very, very. I mean, experiments are very expensive to conduct, especially clinical trials. So all this make this end-to-end -end continuous learning not possible. That's why developing some super forecaster in pharmaceutical industry is very hard, nearly impossible at this point. So if we look at this pipeline in the traditional pharmaceutical industry pipeline, right? So from the very early stage target to hit discovery, hit to lead, lead op optimization, preclinical, and then get into the uh, clinical trial, phase one, two, and three, and get regulatory approval, right? Those, this entire pipeline, we have tons of prediction tasks, generation tasks. We want to predict whether molecule is going to be successful or not. We want to produce or generate a new molecule that has a better property, right? So, so there's tons of machine learning opportunities. And so what I see, uh, uh, the biggest opportunity that hasn't been kind of uh, looked into a lot is one is using uh, trial data and post-market data to assist early phase drug discovery. And the other thing is using the drug discovery data to guide the clinical trial design, to design the trial so that you find the, per, I mean, the right patients to recruit to the trial. So next I'll show you a, a few papers we have done in this space. And primarily I focus on one paper published in this uh, cell patterns journal and in April this year. So this is actually a, a a cover paper that published there is called Hint Hierarchical Interaction Network for Clinical Trial Come Prediction. And it's a joint work with my students, Tian Fan Fu and Ke Xing Huang, Danica Xiao, my collaborators, and Lucas Glass uh, from IQVIA, and myself. So this paper has two main components. One is we're realizing we don't have a good or any benchmark for making, making predictions on trial outcome, whether the trial is going to be approved or not. And we just don't have such 
data set. So one component of this, we developed this benchmark by collecting uh, different data sources, uh, such as drug molecule information, disease information, trial and protocol information, along with many knowledge from the web, such as those uh, uh, admin experiments and all the historical trials, and put them all together and process them and provide a machine learning ready data set. So at the end, we have uh, um, 17.6 thousand trials in the uh, top, this particular benchmark we created. And the other part is the algorithm for making the prediction. So we developed a graph neural network based algorithms that leveraging this different source of input, the drug molecule, the disease information, and the eligibility criteria of interest, and uh, together with some external knowledge, and then build this graph neural network that has the different components and ultimately predict the trial outcome, whether it's uh, reached the desirable endpoint or not. And we have this uh, graph neural network in every node have uh, embedding and then finally we make this prediction we have this different level of accuracies i'll talk about later and so but this is the, the major two components right it's the data set and the algorithm for trial outcome prediction so let's look at the data set uh, first so for the data set here's some statistic of the data set and if you look at uh, the number of trials, we have 17,000 trials and over uh, 13,000 molecules and 5,000, over 5,000 diseases in this data set and close to 10,000 are uh, successes and 7,500 uh, are failures. And then we, you can, if you can bring, you want to break down by different disease categories, you can see um, there's just a different breakdown, for example, for a neoplasm, for cancer, uh, drugs, I mean trials, there's four thousands of trials. For respiratory system, we have uh, close to 13 uh, hundreds and so on. Then, then if you look at this across different years, it's, these are the uh, breakdown of number of trials over years. And if you look at the success rate over times, um, you can see there's kind of there's fluctuation and towards the end it, there's a huge drop but but really it means uh, many of the successful dry, uh, trial hasn't been completed for the the later part of this uh, data set so only the ones that um, kind of clearly not working out so they terminate early so we, we know a lot more failure here in the recent trials and then this is the number of patients recruited over times. And um, yeah, so that's uh, this top uh, benchmark for trial outcome prediction. And it's completely public available. You can find out that from our GitHub repo, repo and uh, use it in your own research. So next, I want to talk about uh, uh, the method. So if I want to... Uh, Give you a little bit deeper dive of the this graph neural network approach for trial outcome prediction right it has this different modules right let's look at this from left to right and on the left hand side we have this three different input drug molecule structures so it's uh, smile strings as chemical uh, representation of molecule that's our raw input number one Number two, a disease description, right? For example, the disease name, and then we can uh, link that to uh, diagnosis code and the description of the code and uh, the hierarchy of the code. Then we have a trial protocol, especially uh, the eligibility criteria, what's inclusion and what are the exclusion criteria. Then we parse the, all the three inputs through some neural network embedding. For example, for 
the drug molecule, we use uh, this message passing neural network, MPNN, to embed that into a, a vector representation for the molecule. Then for disease, we use uh, another um, embedding that's specifically designed for disease information, leveraging the hierarchical nature of the disease hierarchy and this grand embedding to embed the disease information into a, a vector. Then similarly, for trial description, we embed the, this eligibility criteria into another embedding, right? They have these three embeddings. And there's some nuance here. Um, what, what if you don't have all three input, right? Sometimes you don't know the, the, the molecule information. And for example, you want to do some competitive analysis of some um, your competitors' trials, right? You don't have that uh, drug molecule information, and but you still want to make assessment, right? Like how likely is this trial going to succeed? And in that case, we have a capability to impute the molecule embedding based on the disease and the uh, trial protocol so that you can still make a prediction even if you don't have the drug molecule information. So that's the, the first module. Then second module is this knowledge graph pre-training. Uh, there is a lot of information on the web uh, about the historical experiment that people have done on drug properties, such as all this uh, ADMET, different uh, properties. And we use that historical experiment to train a set of uh, embedding or classifiers to map the molecule information into this additional embedding for each of those properties, right? For absorption, for distribution, for metabolism, for excretion, for toxicity. So those will be kind of an augmented embedding for the molecule structure. Then we also have another prediction based on historical trials, right? Because for historical trial, we know uh, for a given disease, what's the likelihood of that type of trials for that disease is being approved or not. So we have uh, some embedding for that disease approval risk. And that's uh, another embedding, augmented embedding here. Then once we have this part, uh, this additional embedding in blue, we put them all together with the original embedding that's in green and together uh, that pass through some graph neural network here to get some additional embedding that's in yellow, right? So we have this knowledge graph here that, that connect drug disease and trial protocol together with all this augmented embedding together uh, to finally predict the trial outcome. So that's kind of the, uh, the overall flow. And there's some, some other details I'm, I'm going to skip. But uh, finally, you will be able to get a, a probability uh, prediction of the trial outcome. So next, let's look at some of the, the experiment results. Right? So we can look at a hint model compared to a whole bunch of other methods. Some are classical class, uh, machine learning classifiers, such as logistic regression, uh, random forest, XGBoost, AdaBoost, and, and so on. And then some neural network based model, uh, FFNN, DPNO, and Compose. You can see the different level of uh, pr prediction performance for precision recall error in the curve, F1, and uh, ROC AUC. And across the board, uh, Hint performed a lot better than all those baselines. And if you look at the probability predictions uh, and then for different bucket of those uh, probability prediction, and the actual success and failure probability actually align pretty well, right? For example, if we predict the probability below 0.2, the, all of those trials actually failed, so which is indication of, okay, the prediction actually makes sense, right? If we predict something is 100% or I mean, above 80% uh, success rate, then majority of them actually uh, succeeded, right? Get, the, get to the approval. And some breakdown on based on different disease categories, and um, and 
and also uh, some based on the high prevalent disease, which is uh, more, more commonly occurred. Some are low prevalent disease, so, so there's some uh, performance gap as in there as well. And we also have some uh, uh, additional experiments on um, if you have a missing value, right? So when I early on I said, if, okay, if you don't have the molecule information, can you still make a prediction? You can see that uh, in our case, we I mean, this red uh, curve is our method with imputation. You can the performance to us, I mean, gradually drops as you have more and more missing information about the molecules. But uh, other methods um, would, would drop much quicker if you don't have the imputation capability. And here's some, some concrete example of um, trial outcome prediction case study. Then we just use some real world trial and showing you the example of if we have a lower predictive uh, prediction and they actually indeed likely to fail, right? Some of those are a pretty well-known trial in the recent uh, recent years. And some on heart failure drugs, right? The, the, we predict the probability of, of 47%. So it's not that high, so it failed. Then we also have uh, some higher, much higher probability prediction, then they indeed uh, are lead to approval. So that's uh, another confirmation. And so that's uh, the work of Hint. Um, a hierarchical interaction network for clinical trial outcome prediction. And in this work, we provide a, a, a benchmark so that you can use uh, in your own research for if you want to study trial outcome prediction, they're completely public avail available. And if you just search uh, the paper, you can find the GitHub link. Oh, it's actually also over here and you can uh, use it. And we also have the hint algorithm provided uh, in the same GitHub repo and based on this uh, graph neural network based approach. And so that's the first work. The next uh, couple of slides, I'm just quickly showing you some additional work we have done in this drug discovery space recently. And one is on this early phase uh, antibody uh, design. So this is a kind of very uh, important uh, treatment for many uh, recently for for anti using antibody and it's a fast growing class of drugs has been approved for a wide range of indications such as cancer I mean or autoimmune diseases so uh, important task here is to design this uh, uh, complement territory determining regions, right? So, so each antibody is usually have this Y shape uh, structure. And uh, the important part are this uh, loop, like this open loop, six open loops here, that's uh, determining the binding region to uh, of the antibody to antigen. So this the, the sequence here, the amino acid sequence here is very important. And in this work, we propose a machine learning based method to design those um, CDR loops using a constrained energy model. And I won't talk about all these details, but it's uh, going to be published in upcoming uh, KDD conference. And, and please check it out. And another line of work is on patient trial matching. So this is a later phase of this drug discovery and development uh, pipeline. When you have a drug molecule, you want to push that through a trial, the actual trial, you have to recruit patients, right? So that's a, a very expensive process. It usually costs 6,000 to 7,500 uh, US dollar per patient, right? For, to, for this recruitment process. And the success rate is very low and take a long time. So that's a, a huge risk and expensive uh, risk to have, right? So can, can we do this more in an automated fashion, matching patient based on their electronic health record data to the trial based on the description of the eligibility criteria. So we have a method that does that. And on, uh, based on, uh, I, will, I will skip the, the methodology details, and but it's published in uh, KDD 2020 
and it's called Compose Cross Model Pseudo Siamese Network for Patient Trial Matching. Please check 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 it out. Okay, so with that, I just want to conclude um, by saying machine learning method can pr uh, provide accurate prediction for many different drug discovery and development tasks. Today, I uh, explain or presented three of them, and primarily talk about this first one, trial outcome prediction. And but uh, machine learning has, can also be used for early phase drug discovery, for, for example, for antibody design, and for later phase of the drug development process for patient trial matching. Right? Here are some references of all three papers. And thank you very much.